So, this is where we left off Poisson distribution. S that you do this table. So, I have my R studio open. First thing we need to do is get these data into R. So, we convert a frequency table into a vector. The reason we need that is because we have to calculate the average. We need the average for the Poisson. Why? Because the Poisson distribution is defined by the average. Right? Poisson distribution is defined by the average. So we need to have that value. That value is the lambda. So once we have lambda, then we can generate our, our probabilities and our expected values. So. Here is mine. So I've got my practice table. Uh, I made X and F. So usually this is kind of how I do it. Um, X is my 0 to 8 value. F is my frequencies. And then trees is going to be my data set. So that's going to be my vector, trees. So I repeat X comma F times run that, and then when I calculate the mean of trees, I get 2.225806. Now, uh, if we were doing it by hand, we could round. In R, I'm going to suggest not rounding. That way our answers don't get rounded until the very end. All right, so let's get our Poisson probabilities. So, P of X, column, recall we use D poise, D poise, and what we want is zero to eight. So we want to get probability of getting zero, and then the probability of getting one, and two, and three, and four, and so forth, all the way up to eight, all right? And we need lambda which in this case is the mean of trees. It's this 2.2258 value. All right, so instead of type, typing in the 2.2258, I just, I'm gonna give it mean of trees. And then when I run it, I get all of my values. Now those are the probabilities. All right, those are the probabilities. We use the probabilities to calculate our expected values. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to copy this, paste it, all right, and then what we need to do is multiply it by our total sample size, because this is telling us that's a probability of getting zero. That's a probability of one, of two, of three, and so forth. We have to have a total number of trees, uh, or total number of grids that we counted here, all right, so... How did we get that? Well, it's going to be the length of my trees or the sum of my frequency vector. All right, and that's going to give me how many grids we expect to have zero trees, how many grids we expect to have one tree and two trees and three trees and so forth. Now, it's, what's typical is that we're working with discrete data. We're working with whole numbers only. So by convention then, I can go ahead and round these values to the whole number. So now we can kind of see what we're looking at. Now I know in terms of rounding, we always want to round one more digit uh, than what we've actually measured, and, and that's true. So if we were calculating the mean, if we were reporting the mean, we would report 2.2. We wouldn't round one more when we're doing our expected value. We'll go to the whole number so that way we can say we can make our comparison. So given the data, move this over. See if we can see it. Yep. All right. You can see that we're basically getting exactly what we observed here, which should be the case 
should be the case here because I generated a Poisson distribution. I generated these data using the Poisson distribution. So then we had our second part to this, which was to uh, calculate these assuming a mean of three. And what we can do, I'm going to copy and paste. All right, so we're going to calculate uh, P of X and E of X, assuming mean equals 3, which is lambda. So I'm going to do this all at once. So take that first one. So depoise. Now I don't need the mean of the trees. We actually are defining what our lambda should be. So we're saying lambda is equal to three. And then we're still going to come up with our expected counts. And we're still going to use the length of the trees because we're going to say, you know, we assumed. We would, we would see three trees per grid. That was our average, because maybe that's what we saw last year. That's what we saw at another location. But we want to compare what we actually observed to that mean of three. Right? So we're asking, is the mean actually equal to three? Well, we can do it using a goodness of fit test. Where do we get our expected values for this goodness of fit test? Right here. This is how we did it. This is how we will do it. So I run it, and I get my probabilities, and then I get my expected values. So just sliding it over, you can see that we observed 13, but if it was actually a mean of 3, we only expected 6. We observed 30 grids that only had one tree. If we had a mean of 3, we were only expecting 19. We saw 33 grids that had 2, we expected 28. We saw 25 that had 3 in there. We expected 28. So these first two, these 33 and 25 versus 28, 28, those aren't too bad. I mean, they're kind of close, kind of close. But you can see we had, you know, we expected much less for 0 and 1. And then as we go higher to 4, you know, we saw 14, we expected 21. We saw 6. We expected 13. We saw two, we expected six. We saw one, we expected three. We saw zero, we expected one, and so forth. So we kind of deviate from those places. Now, we can kind of eyeball it, say, yeah, maybe this isn't close, but how do we define what's close when, when working with the numbers? Right? Is 33 and 28 really that close, or is that kind of far off? That's why we, we need a statistical test. Questions? Did you get this? Not too bad? Not too bad? All right, so the other part of this, the other part of this is knowing which distribution to use. All right, because we, we get these types of questions where we are, you know, we need to choose this statistic, or we're, we know we're going to do a goodness fit test, but then we, we, we're we left with, well, what should we use to calculate our estimated values, All right? For genetics, it's pretty easy. I mean, we, we've learned 3 to 1, we've learned 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, 7 to 2, the other one, what are the other common some of the other common, common genetic ratios and, and we can just kind of mess around and figure out which ones match our data right we can't really do that when we're actually collecting data you know, biological data uh, or you should say continuous discrete data discrete data so which distribution should we use binomial distribution or Poisson distribution so we'll start with this we asked a question about number of brake pads that we observe in a day. All right. 
and not just brake pads, we're at an assembly line, we're producing brake pads, and at the end of the day, you get a report on X number of pads came off and there was a problem with them, so we, we took them off, we didn't package them. So what distribution models that first one? Binomial or the Poisson? Take a stab. How about this? Write your answers down for all of these. This is where like having a, a survey pop up and say, okay, now here's a survey. <laughs> then I can see the answers. I think that would be pretty cool. I just don't know how to integrate that into, into PowerPoint. So we got at least one guess. Fine. Let's take a few minutes to kind of answer these ones. So number one is number of bad brake pads that come off an assembly line in a day. Number two, number of brake pads, bad brake pads in a batch of 100. Uh, number three, seconds between lightning strikes. Number four, number of home runs in 15 at-bats. Uh, number five, age of first infection. So we can say age of our first flu infection. Next one is time to death. So we expose an organism to pollution, we record when they die. Number of offspring that survive to maturity. And number of offspring out of a thousand that survive to maturity. Choices binomial or Poisson. Okay, kind of write down some answers. I'll give you a minute or two, and we'll, we'll go on. Now, as we're doing this, this is for a reason because I can have a problem where I ask you a probability, and if you choose the wrong distribution, well then you get the answer wrong. So on our exam, what we'll have is, we'll have something like this, where you have to be able to recognize what probability to use, what probability distribution to use, and then when I actually ask you to calculate the probability, I'll say, use the binomial distribution, calculate this probability. Use the Poisson distribution, calculate this probability. Surely there's something I can integrate. Yeah, a link. I'm going to look into that. Maybe I could get the link, figure out how they do that, and have my own link. That's a good idea. All right, number of bad brake pads in a day. What is your answer? So I have one answer here. I was in class. What did you say? Binomial or Poisson? Cody, you look like you wanted to answer. Like you were, you were like hesitating. I could see it. What did you say? Why Poisson? Okay, so so you use your your brilliant test taking skills to recognize that I had things kind of in a, in a in a pair almost. So the next question was number of bad brake pads in a batch of 100. So what's the difference between these two questions? Association by group and association by time. Okay, association by group. That's this. We have a group of 100, and then the other one's association by time. How many brake pads came off of the assembly line in that day? We have no idea. We don't know. So we don't really have an out of number. It's just 
how many brake pads came off that line? Perhaps today we had 1,000 brake pads came off, come off the line. Perhaps tomorrow we have 5,000. It doesn't really matter, all right? And that, by definition, then, is our Poisson distribution because we didn't ever set a maximum number that came off. Now, if we said every day we produce 10,000 brake pads, and then I ask, okay, how many bad brake pads do we have in that day? Well, that's out of 10,000 at that point. But in this, this example, we don't ever say how many brake pads come off the line. All right? Equivalent is beer, all right? the, the bottling lines, the canning lines. All right? Those lines, you can say, yeah, we produce X number of bottles or X number of cans per day, but you don't know that. You can have a can that gets stuck and it slows the assembly line down a, a, in a single day. All right? So they have to slow it down and you have, you have lower production today than you have tomorrow. Perhaps tomorrow everything runs smoothly. So this first one is definitely Poisson. We don't have an out of number. The second one is, it's not Poisson, it's binomial. Now we do have an out of number. So how many bad brake pads do we have out of 100? All right? So that's, kind of, that's a big part of our distinction. Do we have an out of number? So then our number three, seconds between lightning strikes. Which one do you think that is? It's a Poisson. Why? Yeah, there might not ever be a lightning strike. It's kind of our time to event, all right? Our, te our, our temporal event. It could be infinite number of of, min of seconds, all right? Infinite number of seconds, or it could be one second. Who knows? All right. Number of home runs in 15 at bats. We're in the postseason. I have no hope that the Cubs are going to get past round one. But... Oh well. Binomial or Poisson? Binomial. We give the out of. All right. It's out of 15 at bats. Age of first infection. Poisson. We don't. I mean, we might never, never get it. All right. Might never get it. So the age would be infinite. Time to death. Poisson. So even though we do have an endpoint, all right, nothing's gonna live forever. All right. In reality, this model's a Poisson. This would model a Poisson. And survival analysis. Some of you may have seen like survival curves. That is a Poisson distribution. Number of offspring that survive to maturity. Poisson or binomial? Poisson, all right? We don't know how many offspring we actually have. So there, there is no out of number. Unlike this last one, which out of 1,000, how many survive to maturity? That's our binomial, all right? So time to events, survival, time to death, all right? This, that's all Poisson. And then when you have these like number of bad brake pads and, and a, a number of something, you have to think, is there an out of number, yes or no? If there is an out of number, then it's binomial. If it's not, then it's a Poisson, all right? Any questions? So the discrete distributions are, I'll say the easier distribution, because it's a whole number. And it's very easy. It's very, very easy to conceptualize. Uh, you know, the probability of an event happening, because it's, you know, three offspring. Probability of rolling a set, all right? All of that stuff is, is very easy. Continuous distributions don't have that same ease of calculation. I mean, it, you're going to see if the code is easy. Right? The code is easy, but conceptually it's different. All right. So what we're going to talk about is continuous random variables, and we're going to introduce the normal distribution in this case. All right. So when we So when we look at continuous distributions, we recognize that in these distributions, our x values can take on any number between two fixed points. So it could be any number between 0 and infinity. It could be any number from negative infinity to positive infinity. It could be any number between 1 and 5. 
All right? We have fixed limits. We, we can have fixed limits. But with these continuous distributions, you can take on any number. Uh, so if we ask, what's the probability of getting a 3? Well, what is that probability? How do we calculate? Because are we talking about a rounded 3? Are we talking 3.0? which is also rounded. Are we talking about 3.00 or maybe 3.0001? All right, you've got an infinite number of possibilities, which means then our probability of that single number is going to be infinitesimally small. All right? It's going to be so small that it's basically zero. So how do we get around that? Well, we have to look at our, di our densities. We have to look at our distributions. And for that, this, it's called a probability density function. So all of our probabilities are going to be represented by a curve, and it kind of represents the likelihood that we would get those values, or at least the range of values, in a certain situation. All right? So this is one curve. Move my, move my image here. All right, so this is a curve, uh, probably an F distribution. No, chi-squared. I have it right here. It's a chi-square with four degrees of freedom because the chi-square is a continuous distribution. All right, we don't have bars. We don't have single points because our value could take any number from zero all the way up to positive infinity. All right, so if we ask for a single point, what's the probability of getting this 1.11204689? The probability is actually going to be zero. But that's not kind of what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for what's the probability of getting that value or at least really close to that value. How we accomplish it is to take an area under the curve. So you take an x value that's like just below this one, and you take an x value that's just above that value, and now we get a slice. This is exaggerated, but we get a slice between those two points. And that area now represents our probability. All right? So the area under the curve. So we have an equation that describes the curve itself. All right? That's our probability density function. And then we have an equation that describes the area of the curve. Who can tell me how we go from this probability density function to an area under the curve? How, what's that? Yeah, we, it, OK, so I don't know how many of you have had calculus. But if you remember from pre-calculus, some of you have had, it's an area under the curve. We take an integral. Right? So take an integral to, to get that. And that's what this cumulative distribution function is. Right? It's integrated this PDF function to get an equation that gives us the area under the curve. Now, what do we know about the area under the curve? Well, the area under the curve represents our probabilities. Right? The probability of getting between two values, all right? And for us, we're taking really small slices for each of our small points, and we're going to say, we're not going to work with this 1.11204689. We're going to say, we're going to work with 1.11, and then 1.12, and 1.13. So we've rounded, and our implied limits then give us that slice that we're interested in. Well, the sum of all of those slices are going to equal 1. And the sum of all of those slices is the complete area underneath that curve. All right, so from 0 to infinity, that area under the curve is, has to sum to 1. That's our probability. All right? We could use formulas to calculate the probabilities. In some cases, we can use statistical tables. All right, and we're, I'm going to show you some of our statistical tables. We'll probably work with them so you can kind of get a feel for, for how to do it, um, how, to, how to use the tables. Or we can use R, and we're also going to learn how to use R to do those equations, or to do those calculations. All right, so cursor, there it is. What types of distributions do we encounter in this class? We encounter, encounter the T distribution. That's a continuous distribution. When do we encounter it? We use it to, to estimate confidence intervals. We are going to learn how to do that. Also, T distributions are, are used when we perform a t-test. So by definition, the transformation that we make on our data gives us a t-value 
that if all of our assumptions are met, follows a T distribution. And now we can kind of get a probability value, the probability of getting a T as extreme or more extreme just by chance alone. That's a, a P value. Right. Chi-square distributions, that's a continuous distribution. We can use chi-square distributions to calculate confidence intervals of our variances. Are we going to do that? No. I say it's time permitting. We're not going to do it. All right. Even if we had time, we're not going to do it. It's pretty rare. If you need to ever do that, come talk to me. I'll show you how to, how to do it. All right. But we are going to use chi-square distributions because they're used when we perform g-tests and chi-square tests. What are those? Those are the goodness of fit tests that we're going to return to. Right. F distributions. F distributions, we use them when we test for equal variances. You'll see the F in, in one of the tests that we run. All right. Also, the F distribution appears in the analysis of variance. That's our test statistic uh, for that type of, uh, for that statistical test. And then the last one we're going to encounter is a normal distribution. The normal distribution is used when we have one test, one sample test of means for a population. So if we're not comparing a sample, we're not asking, is our sample mean equal to some value? That's, we use a t-test, that's a one sample t-test. If we have a single value, you say, is this part of our population, then we can use our normal distribution. The other thing is that it, once we get to a large sample size, then our t-distribution approximates a normal distribution, and then we can start utilizing some of the, the values from that normal table. So we're going to encounter these things here in this class. We're going to start with the normal distribution. This is probably the most important distribution to know. It's our bell curve. Right? Why is it the most important? Because parametric tests assume that our data follow this normal distribution. All right, so a parametric test kind of by definition says that it is normally distributed. Now for us, our samples and, and the law of averages and, and stuff, uh, said central limit theorem kind of tells us that with all of these distributions, if we take the mean of a sample that's not normally distributed, then the sample means are going to approximate this normal distribution. And then we can do a lot of different test statistics from it. That's our parametric test. What do we know about this distribution? Well, it's a bell-shaped curve, right? classically bell-shaped curve. But that's not necessarily correct because our distribution is actually defined by both our mean and our standard deviation. So it's defined by our central tendency and by the location. You have that curve up there is a bell curve. But we can also get a normal distribution that looks something like that, that is incredibly flat. We have a mean. And we just have a very large standard deviation. That's still a normal distribution. So with this normal distribution, we, you know, because it's defined by means and standard deviations, and we're continuous, we have an infinite number of curves that we can produce uh, for the, this distribution. And these infinite number of curves are going to vary based on their mean and standard deviation. When we reference a normal distribution, and when we reference any distribution, we always would reference it like this, where I say x, squiggly, and then normal. So what that means is that our sample x is from a normal distribution of mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. All right. Now, as written, this is in reference to a population. So our sample x is from a population that's normal with the mean, sigma, and a standard deviation. Mean mu and a standard deviation of sigma. We could do the same with the sample, but then we would use x bar and s. Properties of this. Move that over again. Our distribution ranges from negative infinity to positive infinity, even if our mean is, let's say, 200 or 2,000. Right? You still have a very, very small chance of getting negative numbers. Might be unrealistic biologically, but statistically, you could possibly get it. Right? The other thing is that we are symmetric around the mean. Right? So once we take the mean, 
the left hand side is a mirror image of the right hand side. And that means then that our mean and our median are equal. And both of those are equal to the mode. Right. Can we use that information to assess normality? No, not really. I mean, if we're normally distributed, the mean will equal the median is equal to the mode. But just because they're equal doesn't necessarily mean that they're normally distributed. I and mean, heck, you can have erase that, the extreme case that's our mean, that could be our median, and that could also be our mode. But is that normally distributed? No, not at all. All right, We've got different peaks and, and so forth. So just kind of as an extreme case, don't rely on this, median equal mode, mean equals median equal equals mode to assess normality. It just doesn't happen. All right, so as part of this normal distribution, there are some useful relationships. Uh, one standard deviation away, so one standard deviation above and below the mean, captures 68% of our data points, approximately. Two standard deviations away from our mean, so two above and two below, captures approximately 95% of our data points. Three standard deviations away captures about 99.7% well, of all of our data points. All right, so two times the standard deviation represents an approximate 95% confidence interval. Okay, approximate. Are we going to make use that to do approximations? No. This is a stats class. We can actually calculate 95% confidence intervals. All right. Can we do it the flip side? Yep. We said the approximate part, right? but we also can go in reverse and say, okay, 50% of our items actually fall 0.674 standard deviation units away, so above and below. 95% of our items is 1.96, and I have 1.960. That's not like rounded number. It is exact, 1.96. 1.96 standard deviations above and below captures 95% of our, our items. And you'll see this value, this 1.96 in our T table. So as I said, when our sample sizes get large, T approximates normal distribution. Our value that we'll use for a confidence interval, interval will converge to that number. And then 95% of our items are found 2.576 standard deviation units away. You don't have to memorize these, I'm just presenting them because there are some useful relationships. All right. What about our cumulative distribution function? So that cumulative distribution function, remember, is the area under the curve. So if we looked at negative infinity and started moving to the right, taking each slice to figure out, well, what's our probability and what's the cumulative out of 100, we get an S-shaped curve. All right, we get one of these S-shaped curves. I'm going to move this image again. There it is. So what we plot is the quantiles in our distribution. So we start at zero at the lowest value, and then we go up to 100%, so that 100 percentile per point. And what you see is that our probability density starts out real slow. We don't really add a whole lot of probability because when we're really small, but then as we get to our the peak of that bell, we get a very rapid increase in our probabilities. And then slow down of our probabilities as we get past that value. I present this here because we can use this information. We know that this is what a normal distribution looks like, the cumulative density function. We can then take our own data and do the same thing and then do a one-to-one -one line, do a comparison. We have quantiles, our actual observed quantiles, and we compare them to our actual or to the theoretical quantiles obtained from a normal distribution. If we have a one-to-one -one line, then we know that our observed matches the theoretical normal distribution. If we're not on that one-to-one -one line, if it's curved or if we have a different slope or, or so, normally it's going to be curved, then we know that we're not part of that normal distribution. That is the basis of quantile-quantile plots. These are a graphical way to assess normality. 
And normality is one of the key assumptions for all of our parametric tests. So we will learn how to do this. We will learn how to do these quantile-quantile plots. Not quite yet, though. All right, so that's, that's what I was saying. So you can compare these theoretical to uh, actual observed. And we're going to do it for the normal distribution. All right, And if we're normally distributed, then our data will fall on a one-to-one -one line. This is a case where our observed actually matches theoretical. If it's not, then we know we're not on we're not normal or we're not that on that distribution. And I say we could do it for any distribution, and you'll see it. All right. So one of our assumptions is if so one thing, and we'll I'll use that analysis of variance. Uh, actually, a t test, two sample t tests. All right. If all of our assumptions are met then our test statistic will approximate a t distribution. All right? And we're going to and our one of our assumptions is that our data are normally distributed. One thing that I'll show you is that if we're not normally distributed, then that t distribution will not follow or that t statistic will not follow a t distribution. And I'll demonstrate that by making one of these for the t distribution itself and kind of demonstrate that, yeah, when we violate these assumptions, we, we're no longer in that distribution that we thought we would be. All right, so we'll learn how to do this stuff in, in R. But before we get there, we're going to introduce something called the standard deviate. So standard deviate is, is essentially how many standard deviation units away we are from the mean. We need to learn how to do that because it's going to allow us to use a table. To look at it, look to calculate probabilities. So the normal distributions, we have an infinite number of curves, which means we should have an infinite number of probability tables. But if we take each of our values, subtract the mean of our samples, and divide by the standard deviation of our samples, then that transformation will produce a new value called the z-score. This z-score comes from a normal distribution with mean of zero, standard deviation of one. All right, so what you can do is, is think about it this way. We have, we're centered at zero, all right? That's our normal zero comma one, all right? And we have this other distribution that looks something like that. If I take each of these x's and subtract the mean, so we're centered there, each of our x's and subtract the mean, we move that distribution that way. And we get it so that the mean subtracted by the mean is equal to zero. The other thing we have to do is divide by the standard deviation. And when we divide by the standard deviation, we're going to cause this to contract or expand right, appropriately to get to a standard deviation of one. So this thing has already a sigma or an S attached to it. When we divide that by its, itself, we're going to get a standard deviation of one. All right. Why is this important? Because the table that we have is a normal table centered at zero and one. So why do we do this? It allows us to easily calculate the probability that our sample or that a value is less than some other value for any normal distribution. We don't need all these different tables. We only need the one. We only need the one that says there that's centered at zero and it has a standard deviation of one. So where is that table? That may open. I'll show you where. So it's on Blackboard. And there are several tables that, that you can download. Here's your Blackboard page. So I have content here called statistical tables. 
When you click on that, it goes to statistical tables. Right? We've got normal tables. We've got a biometry tables, table A, normal curve cropped. And then we have a T table, table B. Right? So we used to use the book Biometry by Sokol and Rolf. And that book had a supplement book, uh, which was a book of statistical tables. All right? We only used a handful of tables. I mean, literally, a handful of tables for both the undergrad and graduate level classes. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to require you to have that. And since we've moved to uh, the OpenStax book, I'm just providing the tables. So the first normal table is something like this. And this is the one that I like to use. This came from a probability book that, that I used when I was an undergrad. All right, I like it because this table here gives us the probability that we would get the, the probability of x being below some value. So it gives us the area of the normal curve to the left of our line. All right, and it goes from 0 to 3. I mean, these are the z-scores because we're centered at 0, standard deviation of 1. Second page gives us the area to the right of that data point. So it gives us the right side of that line. And that's, you know, I like that because sometimes we're going to calculate to the left, sometimes we're going to calculate to the right, and this table gives it to us. So that's the one that, that I used. This one came from that book. Let's rotate. And this one gives us the same probabilities. We can calculate it the same way. But in this one, our area under the curve is between 0 and our point. So that first table gives us all the area to the left of the line. This one only gives us the area to the left of the line stopping at 0. So you have to realize that if you want the area to the left of the line, it's this slice that it gives us in the table plus another 0.5. Because since we're centered at 0, Half of our probability is to the left, half is to the right. Could we use other tables? Oh, yeah, we can. Let me open up here. All you have to do is do a search for normal tables. Look at that. Wikipedia has some, apparently. There's there. there this is theirs. That looks like it's doing the slice from zero up to our, our number of interest. Uh, cumulative, that's our CDF numbers. Let's see if we can get regular images. You can find a bunch of them. So that's kind of like one that I have. All of these, they're freely available. We could generate our own table if we wanted to at all. So those statistical tables are available. Uh, it's this first table is the one that, that we'll reference that, that, I'll, that I'll show you how to use. Uh, I'll probably show you how to use both of them, but I prefer that first one. All right? So why worry about it? Well, these tables allow us to calculate our probabilities. All right? And in order to calculate the probabilities, if we follow a normal distribution, we have to first calculate that z-score, and then we can use the table. In R, we don't have to do that. We can actually tell R what our mean and standard deviation is, and then R will, will manually do the corrections for us, which is, is great. All right, so what types of questions can this answer? Well, one, if a population is normal, normally distributed, then what's the probability of finding an individual smaller than X? So we have a data set. All right, let's say we, we have, uh, what are you studying? What's your research project? Oh, I don't have one yet. You don't have one yet? Cody, what's yours? Uh, Shell. Shells. Shell all right, so let's say he's looking at shell land snails, all right? And he has shell lengths, all right? And he asks the question, well, what's the probability that I'm going to find a shell that is smaller than some value? That's a z-score. That's what that would, we would use that to answer that question. Second question, if a population is normally distributed, then what's the probability of drawing an individual that is between x and y? It's between two points. Same type of thing. Okay? 
I have I have a range here. What's the probability that, that I would actually get a specific value or, or a range of values? That's our z-score. If a sample has size, if a sample of size n has a mean of x, then is the sample part of our population? That is a statistical test. That is a probability. All right? And this value that we get is actually the p-value. And that's why, why we spend some time on it. This is why we, we use our normal distribution. All right, so in all of these cases, in order to use the z-score, our population has to be normally distributed. It has to be. If it's not, then we violate some of our assumptions, and I'll show you how we, how we correct it. All right, so we're going to stop here. On Monday, we will introduce these normal tables, I'll show you how to do it. We'll have some stuff where I'll diagram what we're looking for. Uh, we'll, we'll use the tables. Um, this is something you'll learn how to do uh, from the tables that will we'll be on, on a quiz uh, on the exam. Uh, but then we'll also show you how to do it in R. Right. You can check your answers. All right, uh, I do have a quiz. I don't know, you probably got the, the notice. Blackboard email that went out, right? Turn off edit mode. Uh, quizzes, exams, introduction to probability. 30 minutes, you'll need a calculator. 30 minutes is probably too long, uh, but have a calculator, have a scratch paper. It's on probability, doing what you did with the homework. Um, did anyone do it yet? can't remember when it's due. It's due October 5th, so Monday by 11.30 at night. So you can do it over the weekend. You can do it on Monday if you want. All right, we're done. Y'all have a good weekend.